Good evening and welcome. My name is Amy Sander and I'm delighted to be introducing this evening's event. I make this introduction with my twin hats as a member of Essex Court Chambers, who's supporting tonight, and also as a member of the Bickle Advisory Panel, of which I see the other members here this evening. The title of this Bickle event is What Next for the International Law Commission? And it promises to be a fascinating insight into the future of the Commission's work from those in the know. Sir Michael Wood is the chair of this evening's discussion. A member of the ILC since 2008, I think we can all agree that he doesn't require further introduction. So I will now hand over to Sir Michael, who will introduce our panelists. Thank you. Well, uh, it's, it's on, good. Well, good evening, everyone, and many thanks to the organizers, and many thanks also to um, Essex Court. Um, Amy, thank you very much. I'm going to speak just for a very few minutes uh, by way of introduction. Then we plan to ask the panel a few questions. I will ask them a few questions. And after that, I hope all of you and uh, people online too uh, can also put questions to them. So it's more a discussion than than a series of, uh, of presentations, as it were. Firstly, uh, to introduce the panel, uh, Phoebe Okawa, Professor of International Law, and still, I think, Director of Graduate Studies? Not, not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> Professor of International Law at Happy. Queen Mary <laughs> University of London. Uh, Martins Paparenskis, who is very soon, in the next day or two, to become Professor of Public International Law at University College London, and in the meantime is at University College London, and uh, Dapo Akande, uh, Professor of Public International Law at the Lovatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. I congratulate all three very warmly on their election to the International Law Commission for a five-year term, beginning on, uh, on the 1st of January 2023. And perhaps to get things going, I'd invite them to briefly say a word about themselves. And I'd like to hear what motivated them to seek election to the International Law Commission, which is a very big commitment indeed. So Phoebe, can I ask you that question? Okay. Um, so yeah, speak into that. Sorry. So Michael has first thank you for, for that very generous introduction. And as Michael has already said, I'm a professor of public international law at Queen Mary University of London. I pretty much spent my entire career in the teaching of international law, punctuated in between with advisory work for governments and non-governmental organizations. So um, in terms of um, my motivation, um, I think this is the first time I'm actually talking to an audience who are asking me for my motivation outside the electoral process. So I have the privilege of being as candid and as honest as possible. And as I was coming in, I thought of um, the Canadian politician and academic writer who ran to be prime minister of Canada, my, um, Michael Ignatieff. And he did write a book on the failure of his political ambition, I think success and failure in politics. And he was asked, so what, what was his motivation? He says in the book that he was very honest. He said, well, you know, being prime minister is the most demanding job that a democracy can ask of someone. So he just wanted to see if he was up to the job. And so I thought that in a sense, as a public international lawyer, you know, at some point, seminars, tutorials get stale and you want to see what else can you offer the international community. But really much more importantly, I think um, I have been engaged, I have taken a deep interest in the commission's work since 1991, when I first went to Geneva as a graduate student. I was a student of Ian Brownlee. I was looking at questions of state responsibility for environmental damage. And fortuitously, the commission was engaged with two topics, two very, um, controversial topics and subsequently very consequential topics on both questions of responsibility and liability for environmental damage. So I have continued with a very long interest in, in the commission and its work. And you could say that this has been a very long apprenticeship 
on, on questions of um, the commission's work and its relevance, the de progressive development of international law. So I just felt that I had reached that stage in my life where I could actually put myself forward to be considered for the commission's work and to carry this important forward. Um, again, there are also other reasons. One is personal. Tomorrow, my younger son is going to university. So I'm just at that stage in my career where I feel there's space to do other things. The commission is a big commitment, as you say, 11 to 12 weeks in Geneva. I have absolutely no idea how people manage it on top of a, on top of a full-time job and caring responsibilities. So fortuitously for me, I'm, I have that slight room. And finally, I think the other thing which I should mention is the most striking thing um, about and surprising when I attended the commission in 1991 was that all the 34 members were men. And it was pretty much taken that that's the way things were. No one seemed surprised. And looking at the records, there had been no women in the commission since 1949. So in the subsequent years that I continued to engage with the commission's work, that for me remained really puzzling. Um, and so I felt that if the opportunity arose, I would certainly ask and put myself forward to be considered. The first women were only elected in the International Law Commission in 2001. And even in the next commission, our commission, the term that begins in 2023, there will only be five women and five is also the largest number that have ever been elected. So I suppose um, I felt I had a, a civic responsibility to, to ask to be considered and that's exactly what happened. I just say on that last point about uh, women on the commission, it's very good at least that with the new the commission, its new formulation, New composition. Uh, the women are not all from the Western European group. The last year we had four women on the commission. Four, they were all four from the Western European and others group. Now there's a uh, uh, lady from Thailand. So, uh, Martins. Thank you, Sir Michael. Um, it's always a challenge speaking after a few weeks with this foot everything that needed to be put much better than I could have. Uh, I think probably briefly, uh, I think uh, it's of course a fascinating topic and institution for any international lawyer. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time over the last few years working on the section on state responsibility for the new edition of Oppenheim, Peace. And that I think required reading ILC materials once or twice. So obviously there's a great fascination over the intellectual process uh, that goes into it. As to the nomination itself, I have to say that I also struck with a political metaphor, albeit I think perhaps my frame of reference is somewhat more uh, pop culture related. Well, perhaps not quite pop culture, but I thought of that Yes, Minister Christmas special, sort of the bit about that, well, one, one of course is unwilling if, if one's friend suggests that that might be the best for one's country, one might cover one willingly and take, take it up. And I think there was even an element of truth in there uh, in that I was very, very kindly and unexpectedly uh, invited uh, to be a candidate by three countries that had never uh, had a a representative or even a candidate to the International Law Commission. I think that is perhaps sort of an interesting concept as well to be made in the we of country discussion, where I think I had a look at the numbers and the it's almost invariably that people are nominated by countries who have already had members on the International Law Commission. I think that this year there are three uh, candid, successful members from countries who had not previously had members of the International Law Commission. So I think sort of perhaps there was an element of excitement and also responsibility of um, putting forward the perspective of an international lawyer for a country that had not had uh, that opportunity in the previous 75 years. It was, well, 10 and 12 weeks does seem to be quite challenging, but uh, perhaps with slightly rosy thin glasses, it just seems like a whole lot of fun ahead of us. Very good. Now, Dapper, does it mean we're not going to have to read so many Egil talk blogs? 
if you've noticed, you haven't been reading so many. <laughs> um, in part because of the process that we went through last year. I mean, I, I had never run for anything in my life, you know, school council, class prefect, nothing. I uh, never put myself forward for election for anything before, you know, it, it was an honor to be asked to, to do it. For me, really, with, with the International Law Commission, I think one of the key things is really the opportunity to work um, with a collective body, as part of a collective body, with people who are from all over the world, you know, so the three of us, we have throughout our careers, you know, we've been writing about what we think international law is, and of course, you have a lot of freedom as an academic to sort of say what your position is and to think through that and to try and articulate that. But it's your position. And there's, you know, one of the things that I think is um, quite special about the International Law Commission, and I think it's one of the reasons why the work of the International Law Commission gets the attention that it has. It's not just the mandate that it has from the UN, I think that's significant, but also the fact that it's a collective body with people from all across the world. So it's one thing when Martins Paparinskis or Phoebe Oko or Dapwa Kande says, this is what I think international law is. It's another thing when the International Law Commission with 34 members say, this is what they think international law is. And so contributing to that collective endeavor working with people all around the world whom obviously we haven't done it yet michael's been doing it you know whom you have to sort of work with collegially try and persuade us to what your position is and then try and come up with a common position for me that was just um something that i thought would be not only interesting but um, an honor and a privilege to to do thank you i would say that it's striking that uh all three of our panelists describe themselves as generalist international lawyers. Uh, certainly two of them expressly in their, their biographies online. And I think that's a very good thing because I think you have to be a generalist international lawyer to contribute to, uh, to the work of the ILC. Uh, I was going to remind us all of the various things the ILC is doing, but I think we all know that, the topics it's taking up. I'll just make a couple of uh, personal remarks and then move over to asking questions. Firstly, to pick up Dapo's point, it's so important that the commission is a collegiate body and a broadly representative body, though without proper gender balance for the time being. Uh, politics doesn't come into it very much, certainly not in the sort of North-South regional group, UN type politics. Um, there's obviously differences on, uh, about legal matters, and they're discussed at length, but, but not on a, a sort of group basis, in my experience, because the 34 members are all there as, as international lawyers with various backgrounds, of course, but working together to fulfill the mandate of the Commission. Um, we've already said it's very intensive work for the 11 or 12 weeks of the session. There's not much you could do in preparation or before the session because reports don't really come out. You can think about things, you can study uh, the past, but, uh, but it's really very intensive when the, the session starts and there's not much time to do other things, I'm afraid. Um, the question of choosing topics is, is eternally problematic and the Commission chooses bad topics sometimes, good topics sometimes. My personal view is that it makes its best contribution when it's dealing with generalist topics and that members are and should be, or should be elected for their generalist expertise across the field of international law, not for specialist uh, knowledge in a particular field. So I think that general topics are very good. Very specialized topics, uh, such as, for example, uh, investment treaty issues, aren't necessarily the right thing in my view. I'd just stress two other things. Firstly, um, the very great importance for the Commission uh, to look at the practice of states and organizations, as well as the comments that states and others submit to them. And I think on the whole, the Commission does that very well. States think it doesn't, but, uh, but then states are often blind. Um, it's crucial, I think, for the Commission's success that it pays full attention to 
to what states are saying, but there are signs, particularly in recent years, that states uh, are not terribly happy that their views are taken into account. Two other things, the importance of the secretariat. It's a very good secretariat, the codification division, very knowledgeable, not only on the procedure of the commission, but on its, uh, its history and what it's done in the past. Uh, the fact that members of the commission more and more have assistants is quite interesting. And I would encourage anyone who wants to see what the commission is like uh, in reality, becomes an assistant, tries to become an assistant of one of the, uh, the members of the commission, that gets you into the drafting committee, which is all, where all the work is done, and nobody else gets into the drafting committee. States are not allowed to see what goes on there. Um, so, so that's important. Um, now, I think with that, what I'm going to do is uh, start asking a few questions. I said just for um, 30 or 40 minutes, and then we can take questions uh, from, from the floor and uh, online. So what I would like to ask first uh, is whether there are topics already on the agenda that are of particular interest to you, things like general principles of law or sea level rise, or you know what's on the agenda. Um, and secondly, whether, or at the same time, other new topics that you think should be taken up, and perhaps a word on what sort of issues make the best topics. So with that very general uh, question, I'm going to sit down and uh, I don't know which of you would like to answer first. Uh, Phoebe. Lots of large interrelated questions. I looked at what's on the commissions and, and it's very difficult to talk authoritatively about works that you haven't followed. I don't know the dynamics. So I would be very general and very sweeping. Um, some, I think, such as general principles seems to me to be heading in the right direction. And I have, for almost my entire professional career, taught the undergraduate course on public international law. It's the only way I can maintain my claim to a generalist, even if I do 50%, spend the other 50% um, on teaching specialized courses. So that way, I'm always keeping abreast with developments in the International Court and the International Law Commission. So to me, there is the argument that the commission's projects should not be vanity projects, so they should serve practical needs of states, decision makers. And I see that general principles as filling a gap. Um, I'm sure any undergraduate, anyone would say, what exactly are general principles? Are they general principles of international law? Are they general principles of law? And how do we arrive at them? So to get some guidance on that, I think would, would fill um, a practical need. And, and in my view, perhaps the kind of constitutional questions that the commission should be dealing with, what makes international law work as a system. Um, the other topics which I think could potentially be useful, but I know that they've only received a cool reception, and you may correct me if this is wrong, both within the commission and also within member states, the question of um, succession to responsibility. And I think it may be because the commission's projects on succession have actually not been success stories, um, either whether they resulted in, in treaties and you know the treaties are not enforced, and that each succession almost always yields its own um, outcome, practical results. So why have a set of guidelines on, on succession to responsibility? I think the other thing that comes from that is there's not much practice to go by, but I assume, and um, Martins may have more to say this, that there is an argument that this is a topic that's only of interest to states in Eastern and Central Europe who are still having to deal with the unraveling consequences of the dissolution of, um, of the Soviet empire. Um, having said that, I have no idea. That's, it would be fascinating for me to see the commission completed, not least because right now, questions of you know, succession to responsibility are likely to come to the fore in the context of environmental damage. Um, and litigation in that context, like it or not, is moving quite fast in very different forums. Um, and it would be very interesting if the commission's work on that sheds light. Um, I, that's something I might be persuaded to, depending on who else wants it. I have no idea how these decisions are made or, you know, um, 
to take forward, actually. Um, I think sea level rise is a large and important topic. And also it has the benefit of being one of the few topics that has actually come, the initiative has come from the General Assembly. Um, I think the commission was intended to work as um, an agent of the General Assembly as it were to initiate studies and uh, advance the codification and progressive development. But as I'm sure most of you are aware, increasingly that's not the case. Most of the topics that the commission has undertaken are the commission's own inventions. So this is one of those that the political masters actually want to see through, but it's a large topic. I have no idea how it is going to unravel. It's, uh, I think it's a study group rather than, you know, so essentially maybe provide a roadmap on a very complicated question, um, implications for um, maritime delimitation, which I think the commission has now completed. Um, there are questions of implications for human rights and displacement, and there are also questions of its implications um, for statehood. And in a sense that interests me, because will the commission be able to deal with the questions of identity, continuity, and potential loss of statehood in the context of sea level rise without finally confronting the question that has eluded it since 1941 of 1949 of codifying the rules of international law that govern um, the criteria continuity of statehood and recognition of government so it may well be that that op opens a window to address that large question um of what i would like to take on again i suppose it's a collegiate word, I have no idea, but I would be very keen that one of the original topics that remains on the commission's agenda, which is the question of recognition of states and governments should now be taken on irrespective of its political implications. Um, the concern is if the mandate of the commission is partially codification, then I think it's time to codify all that body of practice that emerged in the period of decolonization, questions of self-determination and the disintegration of states in Central and Eastern Europe. I don't think that has been mapped out in any comprehensive document. There are huge questions now about recognition of governments, which again, both the International Court of Justice, the Myanmar case is a case in point, has grappled with very unsuccessfully. Um, the Credentials Committee seems to have reached a stalemate over the question of Myanmar. Um, aid agencies and groups operating in Afghanistan and um, Myanmar are actually at a loss what the consequences of non-recognition or designation of the Taliban as a terrorist organization means for support that they may give to the Taliban or groups within Afghanistan. There's a tension here between national legislation under the UN sanctions regime and consequences of non-recognition. Again, I think that's the commission's mandate to take on these difficult questions in a political context and offer practical guidance. And I, for one, would be very keen to see that finally taken on board. Um, I think that's it for now. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Phoebe. Who wants to go and step up? <laughs> So your question was, are there any topics on the agenda that we are particularly interested in? We're all go going to have to deal with all of them. So I suppose the politically correct answer is all of them, of course. <laughs> interested, in, in, interested in them all. <laughs> um, I mean, but of course, we all come with our own particular interests and, and baggage. So for me, personally, the topic of immunity of state officials from foreign criminal jurisdiction, it's something that I've written on. And you know, there's a particular interest there, just in terms of it's you know the commission has adopted the articles on first reading. It's been working on them for a long time. They're, they've been it's been a sensitive and, and difficult topic, but it, it'd be good to see the commission finally bring that topic to to a close. As I'm sure people know, the commission has put on its um, active agenda in this the session of 2022, three new topics. And one of those new topics is the settlement of disputes involving international organizations. And again, I think that that's, um, that's a really interesting topic because as we all know, international organizations have become an increasingly significant player in, in international relations, but we don't really have um, 
established procedures for how disputes between international organizations and other actors, including private actors, um, are, are resolved. And that really has a knock-on consequence, in my view, actually, in that it puts a lot of pressure on the immunities of international organizations to the extent that domestic courts are not convinced that there are just and adequate procedures for resolving disputes between international organizations and others. To that extent, it makes it more difficult, actually, for them to continue to accord immunity to international organizations. So I think, I think that's important. You also asked what kinds of topics um, the commission, what kinds of topics are suitable for, for the commission. And I share your view that um, generalist topics, but, but that's a sort of difficult thing to, to define what's generalist and what is, what is specialist. So one thing that I think about is actually thinking about whether the commission is best placed to deal with a particular topic. In other words, are there other bodies that are better placed for dealing with an issue? And sometimes it is the case that there are other bodies that are better placed for dealing with an issue, not because members of the commission can't grapple with it, but just because it may be something in the human rights world where there are other bodies that deal with that or in the trade world, or as you were referring to the investment world. The way that I sort of tend to think about the work of the commission is, you know, when we think about the courses that we teach in public international law, the sort of undergraduate course in public international law, and you think about the, the list of topics that you deal with, many of those topics have actually been dealt with by the International Law Commission. You know, you do sources, you do law of treaties, you do state responsibility, immunity in, in various guises. But there are still some of those areas that we would expect any international lawyer to know about where thinking about the codification of that area would be would be useful. So just, and, and this would be the last thing I say on this question, think about topics that might be suitable. You know, one of the areas that I think has been on the long-term program of work of the commission is extraterritorial criminal jurisdiction. You know, you take a course on public international law, we all deal with jurisdiction, as in jurisdiction of states. Um, and that's something that the commission hasn't really really grappled with, even though, as we know, those questions of the extent to which states have jurisdiction extraterritorially come up repeatedly in various areas of, um, of national regulation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was, I think that sometimes when people venture to speak on a controversial question and conclude that they are all in agreement on something, it might suggest that they might be thinking of different aspects of the particular question, and of course, not thinking of anything in particular historically. So generalist, I suppose, even if we are all in agreement that that is the right framing, what is a generalist topic and what is a generalist? I, I'm reminded that I think my supervisor said that a generalist is somebody who knows um, something about everything and everything about something. Um, so <laughs> So I think I would probably be, I would adopt uh, by incorporation uh, Dapo's uh, politically correct response that of course, as having been elected to a body with a certain mandate, uh, one would be excited to work on all the topics. I think uh, the general principles and the subsidiary means topics are probably the most, at least in my view, intellectually exciting. Uh, they complete, uh, paragraph one of article 38 of the International Court of Justice statute, as it were, providing finally the full exploration of sources. I think general principles uh, are almost there, but not quite there. And some of the most interesting questions, I think, still uh, remain to be fully reflected upon. I think the Second uh, category was a question mark of general principles, those fall within the international legal system that uh, the International Law Commission addressed this year is certainly a very interesting topic on which uh, 
reasonable people may disagree and it is interesting to it will be interesting to see what states make of the uh, concept of uh, principles intrinsic to the international legal order i think i myself myself penned a few short observations on general principles in light of the beginning of the commission's work a few years ago of course keeping a completely open mind on whether i'm right or wrong on these matters uh, i think one subsidiary means is going to be a fascinating topic i think something that commission has already touched upon in its work on customary law in particular and i think those observations in the commentaries about the qualities that uh, judicial decisions must have uh, to count as subsidiary means are have already been very helpfully adopted in state practice i think uh, in the ICJ pleadings last week, they were covered to considerable extent. And it seems to me that this is something that really would work well in responding to that classical conception of what ILC is there for. It responds to a need of states in a format that can be helpful for states. So in a very practical sense of explaining to non-generalist courts, specialist courts, regional courts, domestic judicial bodies, other bodies where a subsidiary means come up, what things should be taken seriously and what slightly less so. So even if they are subsidiary in a practical sense in dealing with individualized disputes, I wonder whether that is the filter uh, through which many of the great questions of treaties, custom, or use corgans might actually turn. So I think that that is something that I'm very much looking forward to um sea level rise is certainly a, a hugely important topic and something i would be interested in working on and i think it sort of also speaks to a two slightly different types of things that might end up in the international law commission i think generally speaking i think that the topics of the international law commission remind me of i think what joel fitzmaurice wrote about justice and martha nussbaum about love that there are certain things that you don't get if you go at them directly. You just have to go through life and do a decent job, and then you will eventually get them. Now, leave aside the questions about you know, justice and love might be too large to settle tonight, but sort of the idea of dealing with generalist questions that might not necessarily be existential for the particular actors, that it's more important to set generally applicable rules and provide a pattern of behavior. And I think at the other end are those questions that are truly existential and respond uh, to a particular aspect uh, that states or a group of states are hugely interested in. So it is not really just providing the technical means for uh, dealing with law treaties or responsibility. It is really answering a particular question, shining a particular light on generalist issues. So that I think is a new step for the international law commission i think that that has been perceived that way both by states and by the international law commission itself and i think that much might turn on the success of providing as the third element of the choice of topic suggests a product that is helpful for states so that i think would be important uh, as to the things that would be of particular interest to me as we're in the future, sort of torn again in these slightly two directions. Um, one topic that I have done some research and thinking about in the last few years is uh, something that the Secretariat uh, suggested in 2016 as one uh, possible uh, topic. So that was the list that also had uh, general principles as one of the topics that then went to do great things. And that is a compensation under international law. So the intellectual argument would be that this is similar to other elements of law of treaties and state responsibility framed by the International Law Commission's work itself, on which there has been a great deal of state and judicial practice. I can perhaps see that that issues falling, broadly speaking, under Article 36 of the 2001 Articles and surrounding provisions might have some relevance. Uh, I think. Uh, 
Phoebe alluded to the environmental aspect, uh, war claims, uh, historical reparation claims. So that could possibly be one direction. And I think the other direction, possibly building on the success uh, of the product that would come out of the sea level work, perhaps, I think, you know, at least, um, I think perhaps in midsummer before uh, BBNJ was not as successful as people were hoping for, there was a sense that international legal order uh, might perhaps be well suited to provide more immediate answers to environmental issues. So perhaps that is the other direction. I think at the level of general principle, and that is the last point that I will make, I, I was very, you know, very much as were well, enthusiastically nodding, even if inwardly, when uh, Dapa was speaking about the idea of the best fit. And I think, so I think at the, it, it really chimes with a number of things that I have been thinking about. So we might express it as subsidiarity. So the idea that you are not really going to replicate a job that somebody else has been doing and is doing better. Perhaps also the idea of effectiveness of a sort that those are the topics that might benefit from a fairly gradual reflection, that those are things that might wait a quinquennium, that these are not things that need to be decided uh, by uh, last Friday. And these are not all topics, although I think as sea level rise suggests that there may be ways of framing questions that are helpful, even if other things are going more or rapidly. Well, just picking up uh, your last point, of course, the ILC does take up topics that other people have dealt with. Uh, sea level rise, the International Law Association, did some very good work. I think part of it anyway, very good, uh, very interesting. And uh, the Institut de droit international, which we're now allowed to call the Institute, um, did, I think, quite a good piece on um, state succession to state responsibility, frankly, uh, rather better than the International Law Commission so far, but that no doubt will improve with the new composition of the International Law Commission. So uh, one question is, what are the relative uh, merits of a topic being dealt with by the Commission or, or by pri private bodies like the Institute or the ILA? I've almost answered it by, by putting the emphasis on private bodies, but uh, that's, that's a question. But I'd like to ask you another question at the same time. Um, codification and progressive development or progressive development, codification of international law is what the ILC is meant to have as its task to contribute to it, not to make it up because it's not a legislator. Uh, but is there any real distinction? Is it possible to distinguish between codification and progressive development? States are constantly complaining that uh, the commission has not said whether something it's produced is the law or is uh, an idea for what the law might be in the future. Uh, do you think it's possible? Do you think it should? So I've asked two questions, really. Uh, I've forgotten the first one already, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think uh, we can't always start with Phoebe, so Dapo. First question, I think, was on um, the relative merits of the ILC dealing yes. with topics that other bodies have dealt with. And I think it's your the way you characterized it as you know private bodies, because there, there are lots of topics actually that the ILC has dealt with, which other bodies have dealt with. I was thinking of your own topic, customary international law. Um, the ILA dealt with that. Immunities, the, you know, uh, the Institute has dealt with that before. But I think what is different is, or rather where I think one needs to think about the potential overlap is when you are talking about other bodies particularly within the UN system, but not necessarily other bodies that are mandated by states or international organizations to deal with issues. And it is there that I think that one needs to consider carefully actually whether the ILC is the best place to deal with it. So one of the things I suspect Phoebe and Martins were asked this a lot last year, I certainly was asked this, you know, should the ILC be dealing with pandemic preparedness? Should the ILC be dealing with issues sort of of that nature and you think well we do have the who 
the WHO is dealing with these things. Okay, so maybe there might be particular aspects that the ILC could deal with. I haven't necessarily seen those yet, but it's important to think within the system as a whole as to whether the ILC is best placed. And when I say the system as a whole, I mean the system of those bodies that are mandated by states to examine a topic. So I don't think one can eliminate overlap with private bodies, but I think certainly with other UN bodies, what one should look at whether the ILC is best, um, is best placed. On your second question about whether there's a distinction between codification and progressive development, I suppose, I mean, there's a question as to what the question is. So one question is, is there a distinction between codification and progressive development? Another question is, should the ILC say that it is engaged in either codification or progressive development? And on the question of whether there's a distinction, I think you know, it's all a matter of, of degree. Um, at least that's the way that I, I look at it, that it's a matter of, of degree. So at one end of the spectrum, you can think about a scenario where a body, whether it's the ILC or some other body says, Actually, we acknowledge that there is either no law or this is not the law, but this is what we think the law should be. That's clearly not codification. That's clearly an attempt to progressively develop the law. The other end of the spectrum is an attempt to say what the law is. So we say this is what we think the law is, and you would say that is codification. But there, there's a real question as to whether it is ever possible to even in saying what the law is, whether it is ever possible to do that without having some degree of development, because the exercise that you're engaging in is an exercise where you are trying to, well, you're trying to do a number of things. One, you're trying to put things in text. And when you're trying to put things down in a text, you always have choice as to how you express that text. So even though you are, trying to encapsulate the law as you think it is, those choices actually, and having to make those choices of just expression might in and of themselves involve some degree of, of development. The second place where it might not be an entirely possible to divorce codification from development is when you express principles which have a certain degree of generality, but you are then trying to either make them concrete or you're trying to apply them in specific cases. And there again, sometimes you have choice. You know, you start from general things, which we might all agree. And then the question is, what are the implications of those generalities? So you have a general proposition. And the question is, does that general proposition imply X or does it imply Y? Now, somebody might say, well, that's codification because it just follows from this proposition. And somebody might say, well, but we don't have this degree of specificity. So by you putting in text that degree of specificity, what you're actually doing is you're developing the law. So my point is, is that I think you can have progressive development, which is clearly so. But I think in any exercise of codification, because you have to make choices, it is very difficult to say that this is something which is 100% expressing what the law is, or at least what is agreed to be the law. Thank you. And just back to your first point, there's also the work done by regional organizations, mm -hmm. such as the Council of Europe on State Immunity, which is used by the International Law Commission. The, uh, the African Union International Law Commission, uh, though I'm never quite sure what it's doing, but it's obviously doing uh, important work and they come uh, to visit sometimes. The Committee of Jurists of the OAS um, just did a, did a very interesting study on non-binding international agreements, for example. So, uh, and there is a good relationship in principle with these regional bodies and the ILC Unfortunately, because of COVID, they haven't, in fact, visited for the last two years. But, uh, but that's important to bear in mind. Um, Martins, if you can add the question. Um, the, the first question related um, to the 
overlap uh, between ILC and other institutions. And of course, uh, there was a private body aspect, which is uh, sometimes hard to say whether ILA or ILC does a better job. I suppose, particularly the private body is led by a UCL professor. That might be a particularly thorny one to pin down, but in other contexts, it is more obvious. Um, I, think, I think it's probably really echoing points that were made that at a greater degree of abstraction, there may be some topics that benefit from the feedback loop that are of sufficient importance for states and that clarify or confirm certain aspects. And conversely, it might turn out that certain topics are more of an interest in an academic setting and that actually states are, rather than antagonistic, are simply not majorly invested in these rules. So those, one might, would imagine, might be worse suited for the International Law Commission. I think really probably pandemic uh, is a good example for thinking about the way how generalist issues and specialized organizations fit together. And I think also probably, I mean, to me, really the functional dynamic, the procedural dynamic, the idea that there are some things that probably cannot wait for five years for the first reading and seven years for the second one. It's not a reflection or criticism of the International Law Commission, but there are simply certain questions that benefit from a lengthy elaboration in, within that feedback loop and some that uh, do not. Uh, the second question was about progressive development and codification. Uh, on the, I think on the general proposition, I would say that there is um, a distinction, the fact that there's twilight uh, does not negate the existence of night and day. I agree with the point that practicalities of application may be tricky. I mean, I wouldn't quite want to say that the greatest um, indicator that something is a codification is the ILC denying it. Although I think Article 41 of the 2001 ILC articles might for some seem a proposition for that. Uh, but I suppose I would differ with the slightest bit of emphasis from DAPO, uh, I guess to the extent that while completely accepting the point that there is an inevitable choice in choosing a particular phrase in English, or as looks from the transcripts, particularly choosing a phrase in French, um, it does not, I, I mean, I think it seems to me to, to reflect the messiness of the decentralized uh, legal process and what the content of the rule really is, that there is, that we are no there there that has the perfect clarity of the codified law, which is then imperfectly pinned down, the very process of pinning it down is part of the legal process as such. Uh, it, I mean, one, one, one thing that came up from some states in particular that have historically seriously engaged with the ILC is, uh, I suppose the idea of uh, importance of clarity uh, on what ILC is purporting to do. There are certain statements that uh, states might have question marks about if they are put forward as reflective of existing law. There are others uh, that uh, might be perfectly acceptable as recommended practice or as a draft for a convention that states may decide whether or not to accept. Uh, and to the extent that I mean, as a basic proposition that, I mean, I think that there's a much of reference to how we teach uh, students. I think that's probably, some states might uh, take umbrage at being uh, perceived in those terms, but the idea of clarity and honesty about one's arguments strikes me as a, you know, a, you know helpful motive mm -hmm. in this setting as well. Thank you. Uh... Just one comment, you, you said the commission takes a long time. Uh, there are some, like the French uh, government, that says we don't take long enough, we should spend a lot longer on Juskogans. It's not something you could do in five or six years, it should have been, but I would say. But uh, there is a feeling that, that we rush things, uh, which to some extent, we do, and I think that's good. It's efficient. You, do, you can't spend years and years. You wouldn't be any better at the end of it. I'd like to uh, ask one specific uh, question, and then perhaps we'll uh, ask uh, from, from the, uh, the other participants. Uh, 
Phoebe has a. You can uh, you can have the floor first on the specific question, which is aimed at you really. Um, the distinction between um, codification and progressive development. Uh, how does that relate? Do you think to this topic of uh, immunity of state officials from foreign criminal jurisdiction, which is the most controversial topic the Commission's dealt with for a long time? We had a vote. And everybody said the commission never votes. Of course, that's completely untrue. The commission mm -hmm. always used to vote uh, during the Cold War, including the famous vote on the breadth of the territorial sea, where there were none in favor of the proposition, none against, and no abstentions. <laughs> um, and so the, the, the article that they put forward to the General Assembly is just a blank, which is quite a good way of dealing with things. But Dapper, what, what um, take the, the title of this panel, what next for the topic immunity of state officials from foreign criminal jurisdiction? But before I deal with that, Phoebe didn't have a go at oh. the last question. <laughs> okay, shall I have a go? Please. Um, so on the question of whether the International Law Commission should take on topics that are taken by other bodies, um, you know, the ILC is the most recent of the codification bodies. The uh, Institute of International Law, the ILA, predated. And historically, much of the codification was always the work of these private bodies as an intellectual exercise. So quite frankly, they're not going to give that up. And I think there's a value in the very distinct intellectual exercise that goes on in those bodies, even if they reinforce or are different from what the commission does. The commission is not necessarily beholden, but it's, it's accountable to the sixth committee, its work has to be informed by the practice of state. So in relation to those bodies, I don't see necessary, a necessary problem in a continuing overlap of engagement. I think the work would reinforce each other. Um, both Dapo and Martins have talked about this. What, what's much more problematic is whether the commission should take on technical topics that are either already being taken by other bodies or being considered by other bodies. The question of pandemics has come up, and again, not least because the commission is very keen to have a go at that. And there are those who feel that, you know, those kind of topics, do you want the commission, do you want a major policy initiative on a question of law coming from 34 lawyers with no expertise in anything other than international law, with no political mandate and no accountability? In democracies, you're not going to have that. The law commission of the Kenyan Law Reform Commission does not take any policy initiative, um, neither does the UK one, so that, that there is a case where if in fact the topic is really de novo, you want someone else to take it, someone with expertise, someone with accountability, and maybe that the International Law Commission is not the place for that. Um, that may not mean necessarily mean that say the commission should take, not take on the question of pandemics, because those political processes are also very slow. And, and for those reasons, it would be impossible even to have a roadmap on what a treaty on pandemic should look like. And there's also the related question that if it's negotiated under the auspices of the WHO, the WHO will have the doctors and the expertise to talk about preparedness, prevention, but how a treaty on pandemics sits within the whole body of international law is something which only the ILC can take. What emergency measures are appropriate and how do those emergency measures fit within the system of human rights norms that states have signed up to? So there is an argument that the, the commission can actually take this as a study guide, produce a roadmap and leave it to um, the General Assembly, the Sixth Committee or other political actors to run with it and convene a conference where these political compromises can take place. But again, I think I would worry if the commission took upon itself an inherently technical topic for which it does not have the expertise, does not have the resources, and sets about to say, have a blueprint of what a treaty on pandemic should be. On the question of codification and progressive development, again, I just echo what DAPO has said. Um, I think it's impossible. I mean, I know the statute speaks of codification and progressive development as if they're two distinct and separate processes. And members of the commission, when addressing their contribution, almost of as if these are two distinct processes. I think in reality, it's not possible to see um, any process of codification that does not involve some element of progressive development, whether you're talking about the law of treaties 
or diplomatic immunity areas in which there was a whole body of practice because customary law is by nature diffuse and certain. And in that process of qualification, there's an element of clarification and that element of clarification inevitably involves some element of codification. Um, in terms of progressive development, again, I'm not sure the commission is the place, echoing my earlier point, to take on, unless it has a specific mandate to create an instrument from scratch, the place to take on progressive development as in creating a new instrument, a new institution, so that aspects of progressive development will almost always involve building on a law that is already there rather than starting from scratch. And we've seen the disasters within the commission when it say attempts to create a whole new regime of criminal responsibility of states and the reaction of states to that, which of course in the end was very much ditched. So I think all aspects of the commission's work, whether it's codification involves some elements of progressive development, but I also don't see progressive development as giving the commission a mandate to create new law from scratch where there is no law unless it has a specific mandate from the General Assembly, like in relation to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Thank you very much, and apologies for, for uh, missing you. Uh, no, um, on pandemics, I have to say there was very little enthusiasm in the Commission for taking it up. There were two or three people who pushed, and the rest of us said, what, what's the WHO doing? We want to know, and, and it hasn't yet been taken. I mean, I'm not saying it won't be, but uh, there we are. One other point I would make about topics is that uh, there's only so many topics that the Commission can do at any one time. And uh, probably five is the ideal. It tends to have had seven or eight recently. And so it just does a little bit on each topic each year and states get confused. And a number of states in the last year or two have said, please do fewer topics, you know, choose your topics. And in the, the old days, in the 1950s, for what I can see, they'd take a topic like the law of treaties, have it on their agenda, pile up about six reports and not look at them, and then take it up and spend almost the whole session on one topic. They did it very differently in those days, but they basically didn't try to do every topic every year um, I'm not suggesting that will change, but it is a fact of life. And I think you have to realize when you add a topic, uh, that means you're not doing another topic because there's only so many that can be done. Now, I did think we might ask for uh, views on my favorite topic, uh, immunity of state officials from foreign criminal jurisdiction. But I think the time's come to, to open it to, uh, to participants. Uh, so even online, that. possibly, but uh, but you're going to please <laughs> do go first. Um, hello, uh, my name is Olivia Flash, and I'm a research assistant to one of your colleagues, actually, and your future colleagues, um, your colleague um, Maria Leto, who's the special rapporteur on protection of the environment and armed conflicts. I also used to be a student of um, Professor Akande, so hello. <laughs> um, my question to the panelists is, what do you think um, will be the main challenges that you might encounter, particularly in the drafting committee, when, uh, when drafting sort of principles and um, articles? What do you foresee to be the most challenging aspect of that process? Thank you. I think we might take three questions and then pass it to the, the panel. Hi, uh, my name is Marta Belitza. I uh, worked as an assistant for the US member, um, Sean Murphy, uh, a few years ago at the ILC, which was a really um, great experience. But I have a question related to the topic that he was the special repertoire of, which is um, crimes against humanity. So of course, the commission has completed the first and the second reading on this topic, and the draft convention is now um, sitting in front of the General Assembly. So I was just wondering what your views are on the political ecosystem. Obviously, as you mentioned, the commission itself is not a political body. There's no political mandates and the commission tries to stay away from politics. But the final outcomes and the products that the, that the commission produces are inevitably affected by politics. Um, so if you could just talk a little bit about how you foresee this new commission's role in navigating that political ecosystem and 
the usefulness of the products that the commission works on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, over here, please. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Fabian Eichberger. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge. Um, I had the chance to attend the International Law Seminar of the International Law Commission this summer. And what struck me was that several of the outgoing members drew a picture of the International Law Commission as an institution in crisis. And they related this crisis, if I understood correctly, for one, to the chase of choice of topics of the Commission, and secondly, to the reception of the work of the Commission in the Sixth Committee. Now, I would be interested in hearing your views on this, whether you consider this some kind of nostalgia, or maybe whether there is a challenge of the Commission, whether its position has changed throughout the last decades, and then what should or could be done about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just make it clear I was not one of the members of the Commission that <laughs> took those views, which I don't agree with. They're just uh, making it interesting when they're talking to the International Law Seminar. But um, it's for the panel to answer the question. So, uh, Phoebe. Okay, so um, they're all very interesting and very challenging questions on which, given that I haven't spent that much time other than since 1991 on the Commission, but the challenges in the drafting committee, what I see immediately as a problem is that the commission operates in the main UN languages and particularly English and French. I already know that that's proving to be a challenge within the Africa group where the majority of members are from the Francophone African countries and only I think two of us are Anglophone and just bridging that divide to work as a group, I think becomes problematic. I have no idea how the drafting committee works, but I've been told it's very important to get on it if you want to have an impact and to get work done. Um, I think I see the question of, and I think that as I understand it, the commission increasingly struggles to translate all their work as well. So I see, I see that potentially as a problem, um, either in terms of documents received from states or operating the two working languages, especially when most members tend to work only in one. Um, on the crimes against humanity, which is now before sixth committee and the final outcome of what happens to it is now, um, um, I think I think it's a very good draft treaty, and I think it addresses an area which was in need of clarification because most of the core crimes now have been codified in one form or another, whether it's genocide or war crimes. Um, I don't think, though, it will necessarily or should necessarily be seen as a failure if it does not result in a treaty or if the treaty process stalls. Um, I don't think the commission's end product, the success of those should always be judged on whether they result in a treaty or not. I hope that the final instrument will inf influence state practice, will influence judicial practice. And it may be that through that process, some of the heat surrounding the controversial issues will dissipate and it will eventually be adopted in, in the fullness of time. Um, quite how that can be accelerated, I, I just don't see that happening in the current political climate. Um, on the, an institution in crisis, I hope I'm not joining an institution in crisis. <laughs> and anyone who's, who's in the UK academic community would know that we we sort of have become experts at navigating working in institutions in crisis. I think the last two years we've spent more time in the picket lines and other sorts of problems than in the classroom. So in that sense, I think we're well placed to deal with institutions in crisis. It just rolls on. There's always a threat that things, things are worse this year than last year and somehow things carry on. Um, I do hope though that the sixth committee can be encourage entice that there has to be a way for them to take the work of the commission more seriously. And, you know, there are only few reports that are received by governments on, on the work of, of the commission. But there is an argument, and, and this is something that came out increasingly during the campaign, that the commission's work is too dense, that unless you're a doctoral student, no one wants to read them, that perhaps they should try and make them more user-friendly, more digestible that the commission should do more of what we are doing now 
in terms of outreach, because most people don't even know what the commission does, what topics are on its agenda. And that ties in with some agenda questions that how do you entice more people to come forward or ask to be considered if in fact much of the commission's work is very obscure. Um, I guess if the commission can publicize their work, make states see that this is important for them, that there's a lot in it for them to engage with the commission. And frankly, the war in Ukraine, the multiple crisis of the few years, uh, probably provides an opportunity to reinforce the importance of a rule-based international order of which the International Law Commission plays a very important role. Um, I think, yeah, persuade states maybe to put more resources. I think part of the crisis is also resource, a resource issue that there's not enough money to support special rapporteurs and especially for people who work part-time. So I hope, I hope that the crisis is not existential, that the commission will still be there. <laughs> uh, there was a time at the height of the Ukraine war when I did wonder whether there was any point uh, getting excited about being on the commission when the UN itself might not be there, but there you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Phoebe uh, Dapper. Thank you. So I noticed that all three people who asked questions have significantly more experience than I do of the drafting committee, because they've all been assistants to people and they've all been in the drafting committee and I haven't been. So I don't know. I mean, but I suppose as a general matter, I guess it's just this challenge of sort of working collegiate, uh, in a collegiate manner with others and with a, you know, it's not a small body. I'm so sort of trying to uh, persuade colleagues and be responsive to, to the views of, of colleagues. The other two questions I'll just take together. So this was a question about the, you know, the Crimes Against Humanity um, draft articles and how the Commission navigates the political ecosystem and then whether it's an institution in crisis. I mean, last year, when you spoke to states, you know, they said, well, not many um, products of the Commission are taking up as treaties, and this is a problem. And in the old days, you know, we had the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and the Vienna Convention on this and that. And the question is really whether that's the whether that's the yardstick for success. I mean, I was and I was and I remain of the view that that so-called crisis of the work of the Commission being taken up by the Sixth Committee is overblown by which I mean that it's not everything that the commission does which needs to be taken up by the Sixth Committee and then adopted in the form of a convention, you know. So the draft conclusions, for example, on custom international law, well, were we going to have a convention on custom international law? I think not. Myself, I don't think it's a disaster that the articles on state responsibility have not been adopted as a convention. They've been very successful. So I don't think that that's the yardstick. Having said that, I do think that there are some where it would be useful to have it as a convention. I think the Crimes Against Humanity one is one such set of articles where it actually would be useful. But that's not a crisis of the commission. I think that's really a crisis of the Sixth Committee. It's about the working methods of the Sixth Committee. It's about the process, you know, of, of adoption of, of, of treaties. Um, it's not even just about the Sixth Committee. It's just about where states are at the moment. We're not seeing that many new treaties being adopted. So, I, you know, I would say this is not a crisis of the Commission. Maybe there's another crisis there, though, but it's not one of the Commission. Well, I do not have a great deal to add. I think probably I would prefer not to speak of things I know little about. Um, I think really echoed up his point that it's probably just a general matter of collective decision making and perhaps echoing Phoebe's point, we know that academics are always wonderful at that. So I'm sure that that will be completely unproblematic. Uh, I think Dopo really put the finger on the real question. So what is the benchmark for success? How do we determine that something is success or a crisis? And in the process of campaign and speaking with representatives from various states, it seemed to me that there's also reasonable disagreement what counts as success. For countries with certain legal traditions, uh, a clear text on a particular issue, whether or not it is legally binding, was perceived as an advantage. Um, 
So there is that disagreement. A few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of participating in a symposium organized by the Brazilian mission uh, to the six committee delegates regarding the uh, 2001 ILC articles on state responsibility and the discussion that six committee will be having this year, whether or not to turn into the convention. That is also really question on which reasonable people and states might disagree. Uh, the numerical majority of states do think that uh, in some ways proceeding in the direction of the convention would be a desirable idea, so probably underpinned by fairly different rationales of uh, ranging between the Venn diagram of those who are happy with the articles and those who are very unhappy with the articles. But again, there may be different benchmarks and different conceptions of the international legal order in uh, that regard. Uh, so I think that's probably a sort of slightly unsatisfactory, intellectually unsatisfactory cop-out that ILC is part of the broader international legal process and uh, its successes and failures are likely to reflect success and failures of international community at that point. But again, coming from the Baltic states angle throughout the cold year, Baltic states were not mentioned by the International Law Commission once. So uh, there was, you know, the politics did not come to it, as Michael said in the introduction, then perhaps in a certain extent, they did. And you know, we, every institution exists in a certain ecosystem as one of the questions, uh, I think very nicely put it, the International Law Commission is not a vacuum, it is one element of the broader lawmaking in the United Nations responding to the functions set out as providing helpful products that states need. And states express their will in a, through a particular institutional body, the Sixth Committee. There was an interesting discussion that I had the pleasure of observing this uh, summer when the UN Legal Council uh, came to give a talk at uh, uh, the ILC and the question of the Sixth Committee uh, and whether something could be done was also raised. Sir Michael was um, sitting on the podium and I think um, when one of the observations related to the possibility of introducing voting in the Sixth Committee, an expression that would not lead him to immediate success in the game of poker. So <laughs> clearly ground for very reasonable disagreement among very reasonable people. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask, are there any interesting questions online? Uh, maybe we'll have, if you could choose one, the advantage with the question online, you can choose the good ones. <laughs> Here you just get what you get. Uh, but they were all good. <laughs> We do have a number of questions. Some have been answered, of course, already. Of okay. Well, pick of, one of, the, of the event, um, we were thinking of. You would like to proceed with a couple of questions. Yes. So I would um, perhaps ask um, if Lucia. Um, Solano would like to ask her questions, which relates to the Sixth Committee. So I think my colleague Liam can um, try to have her ask her question live. Um, and if we only have time for two online, we'll then ask uh, Lester Ortega uh, from Guatemala to ask his question. I don't know if you can hear me and see me now. Thank you. <laughs> this is very uh, uh, modern. Thank you so much for the opportunity to ask the question. And it's a pleasure to say hello to all of you, to Dapo, to Martin, to Sir Michael, to Phoebe. A pleasure to, to, to see you. Uh, hopefully I'll be seeing you in New York soon enough. Um, it, it's a very obvious question, however, it, it, it's recurrent for six committee delegates like myself, and it's how can we do a better job of working together? How can we engage better? 
And the question is really not just for six committee delegates in New York, but also for the ones that are based in capitals. How do we, you know, have a better relationship between the legal bodies of the UN and, you know, in which ways can the six committee contribute, you know, to, to the products that come from the ILC? And we understand that some of those have been, you know, uh, managed, you know, in, in difficult ways in the six committee, to put it lightly. Um, but we just wanted to, I just wanted to speak on behalf of some other six committee delegates. What's the best way to, to interact, to talk more, to, you know, not, not just meet every, every year for, for, for the International Law Week and, and so on, and how we can uh, just, you know, work better for the benefit in the end of, of international law and, and its uh, codification and progressive development. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Lester. Thank you, Michael, and greetings to the three panelists. Uh, my question is actually addressed to the moderator. Um, and my question, Michael, is what would be the best advice that a seasoned member of the ILC like yourself could give to the new or upcoming members of the ILC that are sitting to your right hand? Okay, well, I'll answer that. It used to be said that new members of the ILC should not speak for the first year. They should, <laughs> they should listen and learn. Well, I won't give you that advice, but I do think it's, it's important not to rush into things, but to get to know what uh, is going on. What... However, this is a different year because there are 18 new members out of 34. That's uh, well over half. Uh, normally it's about a third that changes so there's a lot of new members so i think it's going to be very uh, very interesting how you interact with each other and uh, i'm not encouraging you to stay silent for for a year i think uh, it also i my own advice would be not to rush into being a special rapporteur i think it's good to wait for a year or two and then find your time and uh, and act and, and uh, contribute to every topic uh, not just uh, trying to do your own topic or your own favorite topic. It was, it's a general uh, body and uh, it's important that your expertise, your, your expertise, your common sense gets fed into every topic. And the main way to do that is through the drafting committee. So uh, attend the drafting committee on every subject, if you can. Uh, there's no longer a quota, there's no longer 10 people maximum. So you can be on every drafting committee. And, and I was always on every drafting committee, uh, which is hard work and can be pretty tedious sometimes, but it's the way you can uh, help to influence things and, and have, a, have, a, have an influence. So uh, I think I've answered Lester's point. Uh, Lucia, it's an impossible question she's asked you. Uh, We've been trying since the beginning of time to build up better relations between uh, the lawyers in New York in the Sixth Committee and the lawyers in uh, the Commission. The Commission goes to New York uh, once every five years for half a session. That's becoming a tradition. That's an opportunity to, to mix. Members of the Commission can go to the Sixth Committee during International Law Week, but they have to pay for themselves. So that's not terribly satisfactory. Uh, I think the sixth, the, the initiative really has to come from uh, Lucia and the Sixth Committee people in New York because uh, they're, they're very good, especially, I must say, the Latin American Sixth Committee members put in a really special effort uh, into these things and uh, they can contact, they can set up things. Nowadays, when we're all used to doing things online, it would be easier to set up the kind of meetings that normally took place uh, at lunchtime in New York, they can be set up uh, at any time throughout the year. So perhaps the initiative should come from, uh, from, from the Sixth Committee lawyers themselves. But the question's put, put to, to you. I don't know if anyone wants to answer it. We still have a bit of time for another round of questions from the floor. Uh, at the back, you... You've been asking for a long time. There's no microphone. It 
it's here, it's coming, please. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name's Oliver Garner. I'm the Morris Wool Research Fellow in European Rule of Law at the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law, which is obviously part of Bickel. Um, my question relates to some of the previous work of the Bingham Centre. So there was discussion about the relationship with regional bodies and the work they do. And with the Bingham Centre, we utilise the Venice Commission's Rule of Law checklist in pretty much all of our work on a day-to-day -day basis. So I suppose my question would be whether there is an appetite to engage in the work of trying to define the rule of law at an international level. Of course, it opens up questions of whether the international rule of law is different from domestic rule of law. But I think the interest also derives from the fact that the Bingham Center, we're probably looking to engage in perhaps more conceptual theoretical work on this question in the near future. So we'd we'll be very interested in hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's uh, quite a big question. So perhaps we'll just take one more because we're beginning to run out of time. Uh, at the back, please. Yes. Sorry. It's apologies. Hi, it's, um, I'm Yari Krivoy. I, I direct the Investment Treaty Forum here at Bickel. Uh, Martins mentioned um, the possibility of working on the issue of compensation. Um, Two weeks ago, I went to the UNCI trial working group a three meeting, which deals with uh, reforming the system of investor state dispute settlement. And uh, I was uh, really struck by the difference in views on the issue of damages between uh, African countries uh, on the one hand and European uh, countries and North American countries on the other hand, while uh, many African delegations um, were not very active during most of the session when the issue of damages came up. Um, there are many views expressed saying that we need to have some sort of regulation, cap, adopted policy and so on. While other states, uh, particularly vocal European states and North American states were saying that, well, you can't really have a cap, you can't have, have a mandatory uh, methodology to determine damages, each tribunal decides it's on its own, uh, and uh, circumstances differ. Uh, so I was wondering how you view, uh, how you see uh, the work of the ILC Commission on, on such a topic, which sounds quite controversial to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to, to respond in turn, but also to say any final remarks, because we've, we've got five minutes left uh, and we should finish on time, I think. So if I could ask Dapo to go first. Sorry. We have to pass this. Thank you. Um, so just very quickly, let me start with Lucia's question about how can the ILC and the Sixth Committee do a better job of working together? I mean, there are two things that I will mention, which perhaps could come from the ILC side of things. Um, one has already been mentioned, which is I think fewer topics actually would help states. I think fewer topics would help the ILC, but I think for most states, they can't really follow the number of topics that the ILC deals with. You know, the, the report from this year, 387 pages, comes in August, late August or early September, typically, and they're expected to digest, respond. A few can, most, most of them can't. And then the second one, Sir Michael has already mentioned this, it, I, I describe it as roadshows from the ILC. I know some ILC members do this, they go to the Council of Europe, they go to one or two other organizations, but I think actually you can have people going to other regional bodies and trying to explain a bit more what the ILC is doing, not just in very general terms, but actually in specific ways. Oliver's question, appetite for you know international rule of law. It was interesting, the very next thing you said was, well, the Bingham Center is looking to do some more conceptual thinking on this. And I just wondered whether that was then something that was, a, the best fit for the ILC? Maybe, maybe not, but I think the ILC has tended not so far to work on things which are in and of themselves conceptual, though there's a lot of conceptual thinking that one would hope goes into what the ILC does, but it's usually aimed at something that would itself have some practical outcome. And then if I just take Yarek's question, and it was directed more at Martin's on damages and compensation, that issue, of course, of that divide between developed states, developing states is very, it's a long standing one, isn't it, on um, the standards for, for compensation. Okay. 
I want to make sure I end with Phoebe. I'm going to ask Martin. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, I think I will probably incorporate all the points that were made in reference to uh, Lucia's question. Perhaps really just some, I think, the very basic idea of respectful, robust uh, engagement with each other's work in this context. Um, road showing is is a is a good idea, and I think probably it would be important to have, I suppose, a bit of organizational clarity of who goes where and that it is not the case you know the the, sort of the the ugly underbelly of ability to have money to travel to places that there is not the case that perhaps a certain uh, group of the ILC members yield a disproportionate ability to show themselves and their perspectives around the world uh, I mean rule of law is of course something that United Nations General Assembly is uh, dealing with on a regular basis so in a sense you know, very obviously to those who work on that that, that is not an unusual concept uh, in the UN system I think sort of probably the question of the fit going back to the is this a sort of topic that states want and that can be expressed in an article that would be helpful for states but of course some of the things that ILC has done that at least academics appreciate like the work on fragmentation probably skirts at the very edges of that um Yarek's question is a great one and i'm sort of certainly seeing all sorts of arguments there from different sides it may be that these are things that are better dealt in specialized settings mm -hmm. it may be that these are things that are one sub element of the broader secondary rules not only those invoked by non-state entities but also those addressed increasingly interstate setting in the last few years on the uh war claims, uh, environmental issues, uh, human rights issues. So perhaps precisely this fuzziness and uncertainty suggests compliance with the criteria of the importance and necessity for states and the existence of sufficient practice uh, to do something about it. But those are no doubt hard questions. Although things that I will see, I think is interestingly skirting around with different individualized topics, a whole uh, provision regarding responsibility in the principles on environment and armed conflict, a bit of an illusion tucked in in the use Corgan's uh, draft conclusions regarding consequences of breach, and also a bit of a sternly worded paragraph uh, in the section on statehood and sea level rise. So it seems that the compensatory element is a bit like that kind of the Gattini line about uh, fault, uh, like the smoke that is there in the room after the smoker has left. It sort of seems to be around there. It kind of, you can't quite get rid of it. Thank you, Phoebe. Okay. So very briefly, first to Lucia's question in terms of how we can have a better working relationship with the Sixth Committee. I think that's quite a noble aim, um, essentially as a subsidiary organ anyway of the, of the General Assembly, but how do we get about it? I thought that having more meetings or certain sessions of the ILC to be permanently in New York, I don't know how realistic that is, instead of Geneva, and that might promote a more informal dialogue and um, a more organic way of just explaining what the commission does without making a big deal about it at the end of a five-year term or in between that term. But um, yeah, so essentially substitute a period in Geneva for a period in New York. Um, the other thing is, I'm not sure whether this would contribute to a better working relationship, but it would certainly protect the integrity of the commission. I mean, I was intrigued that some members of the ILC are actually part of their country's delegation to the Sixth Committee. And yet the commission is supposed to be an independent body um, codifying laws in the interests of, of all states. And I wonder how that introduces into the commission's work a very overt element of partiality and whether that affects the integrity within which the institution is held. Um, on the other hand, I suppose it means you get to see the sixth committee, but I, I found that problematic. I have no idea whether this is being discussed within the commission. Oliver, on the rule of law, um, I again, I echo that, that it does seem conceptual. And in one sense, you could say that the entire ILC project is a commitment to a rule-based legal order. And so everything we do is essentially to create an alternative to a world governed by brute force. So I would say you'd, you'd have to distill it in much more concrete, uh, concrete principles. I mean, the idea, 
I think there's been an argument in some quarters that maybe the IOC should take on the question of self-determination and, and you know, the right democracy as a principle of international law and what, what democratic governance within the international system means. But I think it would need a much more concrete element for it to, to be taken on uh, on, the, on, on, on the commission. Um, I don't think, I think I'll pass the reparation one notice because I don't know much about it in the context of investment. And I think Martins has given a very good um, outline of what the essential problems in that area are. You say you wanted us to give a final word or you're coming back to that? No, I, I think, think we're past the time. We're well past the time now. So <laughs> that was your final okay. word. Well, I won't miss the opportunity. Of course, the question of lack of gender diversity remains a very serious question. There are five women now. And frankly, unless something radically changes, there was an article in Egypt where the author said that the world will be fully decarbonized before we get 10 women on the commission. So for me, for each one of you to think of ways of asking women who are qualified to be considered to put themselves forward, leaving it to chance will mean that in 2027, we'll have exactly the same dynamics that we've had for the last 75 years. Well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, thanks very much to Bickle for organizing this. I hope there will be uh, a similar panel, uh, perhaps each year during the commission, talking on different aspects of it, because it really is of, of great interest, and this was very good. Uh, the topic was what next for the International Law Commission. I think you've seen what next for the International Law Commission with the three excellent panelists. I have to say that uh, there's virtually nothing they said that I would disagree with, so congratulations to them uh, for understanding the commission so well and it only remains to thank them very much indeed. <laughs>